Take your Bible, and if you would, turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. I have been preaching on the, um, on the Ten Commandments. And um, this past weekend, uh, God laid a message on my heart to preach down in Pea Ridge, Arkansas. Um, I like to, when I go places like that, I know they love the King James, and uh, I like to preach things that are based on that. I am working on uh, a new teaching that just sort of, it just sort of builds up the, the King James, and it shows you the fallacies of the modern translations, but it's, there's a lot of work that is going to go into that, and I'm not ready for it yet. And, um, but I got to thinking about this uh, this morning after having worked on a different message. And um, I'm, I'm still wrestling in my heart right now about whether this is the right thing to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it and I'm going to ask God to bless it. Um, in Matthew chapter 24, I want you to look in, um, oh, let's see here, verse, let's go back to verse 36 and we'll read our way down. There's a lot here to be, uh, that can go into the theme of what I'm going to preach. I preached this at Pigeon Forge, or not Pigeon Forge, Pea Ridge, and, um, then I edited it last weekend and put it out this week. Some of you may have seen it. Some of you may have not seen it. But I kind of got to thinking, well, if I can preach a message like this in a church where I don't really know everybody, then I think I should preach it here at least once and maybe even once a year. Preach this message. The title of the message is called Wolves in Sheep's Clothing. Now, I'll probably call it some, some other title by the time we get it posted online because I've already got a message put out this week called Wolves in Sheep's Clothing. So we'll have to maybe give it another title or something like that. But we're living in tragic days. We're living in terrible days. We're living in treacherous days. Dangerous times, uh, times when it, it's not like it used to be back years ago. You raised, you raised children, you expected them to go a certain way, and for the most part, they did. But it just seems like in the last 50 years or so, the devil has really let loose the wolves. And last weekend when I preached this, it was more along the line, it was more to pastors, sort of to remind them to watch over their churches, to watch over the denomination that they were in. We are no longer in a denomination. And it's pretty much for this reason, is the reason why we're not. We discovered there were wolves in sheep's clothing in the denomination and we were not about to allow them to come into this church and just preach whatever they wanted to preach behind this pulpit. I just made up my mind that wasn't going to happen. The board went along with me. Brother Sterling and I talked about it several times. Brother Sterling said, what do we do even need the denomination for? I thought you knew, Sterling. I thought he had the answer. Come to find out, he didn't know. I didn't know. So we just, we just gave up. We just quit. They sent us a real nice letter. The denomination did. And it was real sweet. It was an invitation to come back. And it was real sweet. And they said... If you don't come back, we're going to make sure your tax-exempt status gets pulled. 
I thought that was real kind of them. So I sent it to Sister Jan, who runs H&R Block offices, and she said, well, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. You're a church. You don't need the denomination. You're a church. Okay. So we haven't been back. We still fellowship with some churches that are in line with the same things that we are in line with and uh, are blessed by that fellowship. But the bottom line is we're just not part of it anymore. I'm not going to have the, I'm not going to fight off those wolves while I fight off others as well. Matthew chapter 24. Let's pick it up in verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days, it, for, at, for as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now I want to, I want to draw your attention to something about that, what Jesus just said. Did you know that the only people in the whole world at the days of Noah who didn't know when God was going to seal the ark up was the entire world. But as far as Noah and his family, he knew the very day that God was going to seal the ark up. God told him, for yet seven days and I'm going to destroy the world. God gave them seven days. They made sure that they had everything on in seven days. Made sure they had all the animals on, all the food on in seven days. And on the, I guarantee you, they didn't sit outside in lawn chairs, uh, smoking cigarettes, watching YouTube, waiting for the flood to start. I guarantee you they were inside the ark waiting to see what would happen. And God shut the door of the ark. God saved his people while he punished everybody else. It was Noah who knew, but not the rest of the people. And I want, I want to let that be an encouragement to you. If you will use spiritual eyes and you will open up your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll study this book, I guarantee you God will show you before the danger comes that the danger is coming. Uh, even if it's just a few seconds before the car hits you, Lynn. But God, God just steered the car away at the right time. Amen. Now, I want to look in verse um, 42. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. So let me give you a little analysis of this. Let's say, Brian, let's say that you... Uh, you pulled in your driveway one day, you got home from work, and your neighbor from down the road saw you come up, and he walked up to you, and he said, Brian, he said, I don't know how to tell you this, but my son's been hanging around some thugs in the neighborhood, and they, uh, they've they been kind of watching your comings and goings in your house, and they kind of know that you've got some stuff in there. And from what I heard tell... They heard that you guys are going to be out of town a certain weekend. And uh, they're planning on that weekend to come in and bust up your house. So, what are you going to do, Brian? They've already told you when they're coming. So send Pam and the kids out on a nice vacation... And you sit there with whatever ordinance you have. Rocking back and forth in your rocking chair. Waiting for them to come busting through. And when they come busting through. Kaboom. Anybody have a problem with that? Oh. So that's what that means. The thieves are coming. 
And if you know what hour the thieves are coming and you let them come anyway, you're an idiot. You're foolish. You could have done something about it, but you didn't do it. Uh, verse 44, Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with, with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of. And he shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Where is the place where it talks about where is weeping and gnashing of teeth, by the way? It's in hell. I'm glad you guys know a little bit about the Bible. Now turn to John chapter 10. This is what I have up on the screen. I don't know how much of, of this I'm going to preach to you this morning. But I just, I, I feel like warning my people. If, if I can go out to churches around the world and tell them this, uh, preach this message to them. And uh, tell them to be ready, to be warned, to be watchful. To be waiting because we know not our, what hour the thief comes. But if we find out what hour he comes, be sure and be ready for when that day comes. But I think it's high time that we watch. Watch, number one, over our families. Watch over our families. Watch over our children. Watch over our, I use this example, if, 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 uh, I don't know if, Brian, I'm going to pick on you again. If you come home late one night and saw a ladder pulled up to your daughter's bedroom window and a teenage boy climbing up the ladder. Poor thing. <laughs> Poor thing. You could just simply walk up to him and say, I'm sorry, but this is my ladder and I need it. Wham! He's not there for dinner time. Amen? He is a wolf. He's a wolf trying to get in some other way. I could tell you stories about my own kids. I won't do it. They're, I don't want to embarrass them. Now, if they had made me mad about something, I would embarrass them. But they've been pretty good here lately, so I'll be easy on them. John chapter 10, verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. I want to tell you, this may seem old-fashioned. But parents, if some boy or some girl wants something to do with your son or your daughter, and they're not willing to come through you, Oh, that's a wolf. If they're not willing to abide by mom and daddy's rules, by your rules, they're a wolf. They can act nice and act sweet and sweet talk you and everything else. But the bottom line is they are a wolf. Whatever happened to... Getting a knock on the front door and finding a nicely dressed young man who says, uh, your daughter invited me over to sit. We're going to watch television tonight at your house, if that's okay, under your supervision. Why, well, sure that's okay. You met him with the shotgun at the door. All this, I was just cleaning it out. Don't worry about that. But that rarely happens. That rarely happens. In the digital age, in the digital phone app age, more than likely, your daughter or your son 
has already, or your grandson or your granddaughter, has already been pawed at by some Jezebel through a phone app that you never knew about. Verse 2, But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake, spake unto them. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray, dear God, that you would help me at least, God, lay out some guidelines, some ideas, some biblical ways, Father that we can protect the sheep that are in our families, that we can protect the sheep that are in our church, that, Father, it, it, it won't just fall upon one man here in the church. I can't see everything. I don't know everything that's going on. That I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would protect this church. Father, the devil has tried numerous times to destroy our church, destroy my reputation, destroy the ministries that we have in Kenya by wolves in sheep's clothing, coming in dressed as wolves, acting like or acting like sheep dressed as sheep, acting like sheep, coming in and yet trying to steal literally everything that we have built over there. God, it, it came so close to happening, God, that it scares me. It scares me. Father, that ministry is yours. If you wanted it gone, if you didn't want us to do it anymore, all you have to do is say so. All you have to do is shut it down. And God, it'll be, it'll be over with. But Father, if that ministry is of you and you've given it into our hands to run and to manage and to take care of and to, and to help those people along and feed them and give them the gospel, God, help us, dear God, that we see the wolves coming. So that we can guard and protect the sheep from the wolves. Who come to steal them away and teach them false doctrine and make merchandise of their souls. God help us to stand strong in these days we pray. Bless this message Father help me to preach it in Jesus name. And all of God's people said. Amen. He says here that. Somebody trying to come in some other way as a thief and a robber. Let me just say this about our church. Things that I've, I've seen over the years. Not, and I'm talking about even before I was pastor. I've seen it happen multiple times where people would come in. I, I remember I was part of a church out in Oklahoma. It was a mission church. And uh, it was in an area of the of, of southwest Oklahoma City area where there was a big growing community, houses going up everywhere, stores going up everywhere. People were doing business out there. There was oil out there. I mean, there was just money everywhere. And so they put in a church out there. And the church that I was going to at the time uh, decided to move over and become that mission church. And I was aiding the pastor, Brother Jerry Pilgrim, I was aiding him with music and youth and just sort of an assistant pastor and so on. And uh, one morning we, we were meeting in a YMCA building and 
I used to get there pretty early, but before I got there, the pastor was there and he was setting up chairs in the, in the meeting room that we had. And a guy comes in real early. And the pastor's thinking, well, good, you know, we got some, got, got a new person here. Whoopee, we got, got, got us a new one. Oh, we're going to try to, we're going to try to keep, be nice to him and, and, and make sure he stays and likes us and becomes one of us. Well, the pastor started talking to him as he was setting up chairs and asked him, said, you know, sir, what's your name? He told him his name and he said, uh, where are you from? He said, well, I live in this area here. And he said, uh, have you been to church anywhere else? He said, yeah. Uh, he said, I was going over here to this uh, uh, Assembly of God or church, uh, Pentecostal Church of God or whatever it was. And the, the pastors kind of started noticing a little bit. He started paying attention to what he was saying. And before anybody else came in, the pastor began to inquire of that man why he was there. What are you doing here? And he says, I believe God sent me over to this church. I've seen that you're starting to grow a little bit. God has sent me over to this church, I believe, to give you the gifts of the Spirit in this church. The pastor looked at him very kindly and very gently, and he said, Sir, I'm not going to try, I'm not going to be mean to you, but this is a such and such denomination church. We don't believe in that. We are not going to accept that, nor are we going to allow that Spirit in our church. And so before anybody else gets here and there's a scene, I'm going to insist that you leave now and never come back into this place ever again. Was that pastor right? You better believe he was. I had a situation one time. I had a lady come to this church. And I mean, you know how we are. We get new people come in. We just want to make a big deal about it. And... One, I can't remember, it was a Wednesday night, Sunday night, something like that, Sunday morning, I don't remember what it was, Sunday, I think it was a Wednesday night. We had a prayer meeting and she came down for the prayer meeting. She prayed for a while and I was praying next to her and all of a sudden, I mean, out of her mouth, she started going, and very quietly, I said, ma'am, I said, do you... Uh, did, did you come from another church? She said, yeah, I, I've gone to other churches. And I said, ma'am, we don't do that here. And I'm going to insist. Now, if you want to come here, you're more than welcome to come here. But I'm going to insist that you don't ever bring that confusion into this church ever again. She never came back. Never came back after that. I'm not being mean. But I am being firm. I have seen the damage that is done. By wolves and snakes and serpents. Of all kinds. Of doctrinal ways and philosophical ways and so on and i'm just telling you i'm not about to let that get started in this church it's not going to happen he said in verse 4 when he put it forth his own sheep he goeth before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice now i want to ask you a question this morning do you know god's voice do you know what God's voice sounds like? To you, does God's voice sound, oh, God talks to me all the time. God tells me all kinds of things. My question to you is, the things that you think God is telling you, can you find them in your Bible? Because if God is speaking to you, or you think God is speaking to you, and you cannot find evidence of a double witness in the word of God, then I'm telling you, that was not of God. Somebody say amen. There are spirit wolves who will say and speak into your soul all kinds of things. 
But does not the Bible tell us as individuals test the spirits to see whether they be of God or not? And the only way to test the spirit is to make sure it's in this book right here. The stranger, verse 5, will they not follow? See, let me tell you this. If you are a real sheep of God, let me give you the good news. You got nothing to worry about. In fact, and this is what I like. The real sheep in the church or in a family. The real sheep will always come to the shepherd and say, Ah, uh, shepherd, I think we got us a wolf in our church. I hate to stir up trouble. I hate to be telling on somebody and I'm not going to say anything to anybody. Listen to me. I'm not going to gossip. I'm not going to go behind your back, pastor. You're the pastor. But I think so-and-so is a wolf in sheep's clothing and I think you ought to watch them. It's all you got to do. And I've had people do that. And you know why they did that? Because they like to get people in trouble? No. It's because they like this church. You like this church. I was hoping to get a few more amens and just two. Love this church. And would hate to see it all busted up. So you know what, Pastor? I'm, you know I'm not a troublemaker. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a real story. She's not here this morning, so I'm going to tell it. If she was here, I'd probably tell it anyway. Years ago. Guy comes to church, him and his wife. And he's one of these Hammond B3 organ players. And I mean, Pam, he can tear that organ up. Wom, 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 wom. With that Leslie speaker, you know, that wom, does all that. You know what I'm talking about? He played for R.W. Schambach at all his tent meetings. You know what he told me? He said, when I played for R.W. Schambach at all of his tent meetings, he said, I would get at least five notes handed up to my organ per service from five, at least five different women want me to hook up with them after the meeting. And I said, wow, I'm going to use that. He asked me, he said, uh, has your church ever considered a praise band? And I said, well, I don't know. It's just really not us. I don't think it is. And I said, um, you know, I'll pray about it and think about it, but I, I, just, I just don't think it's for us. What I didn't know was, Right from that point forward, he called, started calling young couples in the church, inviting them out to his house for praise band practice. Having practice on Tuesday night or whatever. And he had about three or four practices and was teaching them some songs. And one lady out of the group Asked the guy, she said, now when, when are we going to start doing this? And he said, I don't know, pastor hadn't said we could do it yet. And she said, you mean Brother Mike doesn't know we're having these? And he said, no. When she left his house, she called me. She said, Brother Mike, I just wanted you to know that 
so-and-so is having praise band practice at his house every Tuesday night. This is about the third practice we've had. And I, I'm going to ask you, did you know about it? And I said, he asked me about it, but I have not given my consent to it. She said, well, I won't go anymore. And I said, thank you. And apparently he must have found out that she made that phone call because he never came back to this church ever. You know why? Because he found out, the shepherd found out about it. I'm just telling you, wolves will come in. They'll come in churches. They'll come in your house. Paul said this. I got to move on. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men, daddies, Daddies and granddaddies and grandmas, this is what you sit down with your grandchildren while they're still young, and this is what you tell them. Honey, one of these days you're going to grow out of your mom and daddy's house, and the moment you do, the wolves are going to come and attack you, and they're going to be all over you, and they will not spare you. And they're going to try to turn you away from the teachings that your mom and daddy taught you and from what your grandma and grandpa taught you. And your grandma and grandpa love you very much. And we're going to weep. We're going to cry. And we're going to pray over you every night that the wolves don't steal you away. Have a talk with them. Warn them ahead of time. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Had a family come and visit with me. They said, Pastor, our son, we homeschooled our children. We raised them right. We sent our, our oldest son to a fundamental King James Bible college. And while he was there, he was taught to worship other gods like Thor and Odin and Saturn, and they said, what about Jehovah God? Well, I still believe in Him too, but He's a God amongst these other gods. <laughs> right in a Bible college, the wolves got to Him. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one of you day and night with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Do you know why we give a Bible out to everybody that graduates high school here in this, in this church? Because it's the only thing that's going to save them from the wolves. It's the only thing. Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets which come into you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Let me move, let me go to this. What form will the wolves come in? Pastors and preachers or evangelists? A pastor that took a church Pastored that church for several years. Went out into the middle of the woods one day with a pistol. Put it into his mouth. Blew the brain stem out the back of his head. Why? Because he was there praying on the young boys in that church. And the feds were catching up with him. The FBI was catching up with him. These will be doctrine wolves, wolves that will bring in false doctrines into a church. Money wolves, wolves that are only after the money that we can give them. And, and I try to be careful about spotting them. I don't let just anybody come into this church 
and present their ministry or their missionary work or whatever. Not unless I know them or I know them by way of somebody else who really knows them. And I know that their finances are going to be overseen because I'm telling you, whether they're from Kenya or India or whatever, they'll just come over here. There, there's a pastor I know right now in Kenya. He's got three adult sons and he sends them over to America, Gary, on a regular basis to go from one big church to another, hitting them all up for money and then bringing the money back to daddy, who's the head pastor of that church. Met, I've been to the church, met the pastor. Found out what he was doing. He asked me to come preach for his church's revival. And I said, well, maybe we can fit that in. He said, okay. He said, all you need to do then is send me the standard obligatory $25,000 payment so that you can come and preach here. Am I lying, Michael? Michael says, no. Michael said, you got to watch out for that. Money wolves, adulterous wolves. Pastor down 61 here several years ago, got, got his name in the paper because they did an interview of him. He, he must have called him and said, and told him about himself. And he bragged in this article about how big he was going to make this church. They were running about 50 how big he was going to make this church and how they was going to have to tear down that building and build a new one to fit all the people in. And buddy, he was really going to change lives. He was going to do this and do that. And a friend of mine I knew at the time was going to that church. Do you know why he was there? Stealing everybody's wives. Had they checked the church that he came from, they probably would have found out that he had already gone through the wives in that church now he had to move on to a different one. They'll either wolf, they'll either prey on your wife, prey on your daughter, or prey on your son. Sodomite pastors. For the pastors have become brutish and have not sought the Lord. Therefore they shall not prosper and all their flocks shall be scattered. These kind of wolves are pew members. Those who secretly undermine pastoral authority in the local church. I want to say this. I am not a dictator. Brother Sterling... I'm so glad God spared him and kept him alive from COVID. He's the, he's the head elder of this church. And I've seen it dozens of times. Somebody bring up an issue. As soon as it was brought up, we'd all look at Sterling. See what he's going to say about it. Now, I'm not saying that everything that he said, everybody else agreed with. But it's good to have a dissenting voice every now and then, isn't it? Those who secretly undermine pastoral authority. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for you. Ananias and Sapphira were wolves in sheep's clothing. They were there to steal money. In Galatians, oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? He had actual witches in the church. Galatians 2 verse 4, that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came out to spy our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. He had false people who were said they were saved but had never been saved. There was a family here that came to visit for a weekend and there was just something about them I wasn't sure about and they said, well, we want to move here and I met with them and I said, tell you what, let's do. Let's lay out some fleeces before the Lord. Let's, let's, and they, they had a business 
And they had a home and something else. And I said, let's lay out fleeces before the Lord. Let's say that before you, before you move here, you get to sell your business. Number two, you sell your house. Number three, you find work here before you move. And number four, you find a place to live here before you move. And they said, that sounds like a great idea to us. And we was all, Lisa, you were in there with me. We were all in there praying this one thing that God would show this family that that was their sign to come here to move here. A few months later, I hear so-and-so's moving here. When? Uh, next weekend. And I said, did they sell their business? No. Did they sell their house? No. Well, do they have a place to live when they get here? No, they're moving in with somebody else. Does he even have a job here? No. And I knew right then that it was not God's will for them to be here. Those of you who know the situation, was I right? They started immediately judging everybody in this church. They're not dressed right. They don't talk right. They don't do this right. They watch this on television. And he came to me one day frustrated and he said, Pastor, I'll be honest with you, I'm having a problem. He said, I'm having a hard time telling the people in your church how they're supposed to be living. And I said, it's not your job. And I said, if it's anybody's job, it's my job. And I don't even do it unless they come and ask me. Is this wrong to do in my life? Then I'll answer it. You know what he told me? We've been in five churches already and been asked to leave all five of them. And I found out that they had gone behind my back so much and I finally in a meeting with them, asked them to leave. That was the sixth church they had to leave. They went to Second Baptist over here. Brother Jim Waymar was the pastor then. They were there six months. Jim Waymar called me and said, you know such and such? And I said, yeah. And he said, can you tell me about them? And I told him everything that happened. And he said, I'm going to have to put them out here. We're going to have to have a church meeting and put them out here. They're undermining my authority and the authority of our doctrinal statement and our Bible. I said, the quicker you get them out, the better. Those are pew members. They're not, and by the way, wolves are not sheep. You don't have, if they was, if these were new converts that needed to be taught, I would deal with them a different way. But they were not sheep. They were not little lambs. They were wolves. And the only thing they understand is a man with a rod who will drive them out to protect the sheep. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit here in a minute. But moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, I want you to think about your grandchildren and your children. And see if you can pray the wolves away. Do you know it's possible? Did you know that? With God, all things are possible. You can pray the wolves away. You can stand. You know what? You know what? Wolves, wolves usually come in packs. Wolves, lions, leopards, cheetahs, um, hyenas. God has put in them something to where they are keen to looking for the weakest animal in the herd. Did you know that? And let me just say this to you. Most wolves are need meters. They will go through a family or a church 
and find someone who's weak or someone who's been wounded. Someone who's been hurt and go to them and say, oh, I know that pastor, he don't have time to listen to you, but I I'll listen to you. Once, you. once you come and you can talk to me. That's a wolf. Or they have wolfish ways. Amen. You can pray them away. You can stand them away, by the way. As I said, when God puts it in these praying animals to seek out those things that are weak, what that means is they do not like to stand against those that are strong. And when God's people stand together, each one of us, with a rod in our hand. Them wolves don't stay very long, do they? Stand against the wiles of the devil. Resist the devil and he will. Let's bow our heads.